looking at demonstrations, right? For me, that's always great fun. For me, it is. For you, for you too, I hope. Um, so let me see. What do I want to do today? I mean, first, let's make sure that you all know when you are supposed to be giving your final project talks, the talks about the project, not the demonstrations, just the talk about, right? So again, it's fine if you swap uh, among each other. I don't even need to know who swaps with whom, as long as right, you take care of doing it properly. So again, on May 29, it's, I just go by the last name right now, Chandler, Dawson, Doherty, Griffin. May 31st, he, Isaacs, Recker, Rogers. June 5, Shashkov, Shi, Totman, Wang, Chanfu. And June the 7th, Wang, Yang, Wang, Yang Jiao, Ye, and West Carolina, if you want to. So, pardon? Uh, uh, May 31st, it's he, H E. And on June 7th, it's Yi, Y E. Okay? 531, it's H E. And June 7th, it's Y E. Okay. Again, you can swap. Um, about 7.40, tonight we start with the demos for project number two. And the question came up whether I deduce points if you demonstrate a little bit later, i.e. on Thursday nights. In principle, if the project is late two days, I have to deduce right, the corresponding number of points. But if you can prove to me that the version that you demonstrate to me still has a timestamp on there, on the executable, okay, that is like the actual, the actual due date, then I might be kind and not to do so much or at all, even though I cannot really prove whether the snapshots you show me, right, are new or old, but you could, you could also <coughs> show me the timestamps on those as well, okay? So yes, of course, if you demonstrate to me uh, late, I have to deduce, so those are the rules. But if you have to show, uh, show your programs and your snapshots late due to a personal issue or you cannot make it, but you can prove to me that the snapshots and pictures I look at and the executable you demonstrate to me is actually from the day of the real due date, then I don't deduce, okay? All right. So far, so good. Now, where do I want to go tonight? Uh, tonight uh, is a night of the Warner diagrams. Mesa? I just have a quick question no? before you get into content. Um, is, is that week of June 5th and June 7th and things, the, 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 the last thing we'll be doing, or during the next week will we, will we be demoing our final projects, or will we not be doing that? Um, let's see. Uh, Those are, there are, there presentations, are, are these the last things that we're doing? No, or? no, 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 no. Okay. No, 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 no. So uh, the names and the dates I just read mm -hmm. were the dates and the names of those people to talk about their projects on those respective dates. The demo date for project four is actually as far as I could, could push it. Uh, the demo date is on your project number four description where I say demonstrations take place on date so-and-so, okay? And actually, it's June 7. So that everyone has to demonstrate on June 7 or later if you don't get it done on June 7, OK? OK. okay. So if we anticipate like flying away that next weekend, then that's feasible? If you fly away, you should demonstrate to me before you fly away. OK. OK. And then the week after June 7, uh, well, if you, I will assume that a few I hope only a few of you will, will not be able to make it on June 7. Hopefully you can make it on June 8, which is a Friday, or uh, June 9, or June 10, or June 11, okay? So we can arrange something. But I mean, June 7 is as far as I wanted to push it. Really, it's the last lecture, it's lecture 20. And so you should be moving, making progress towards your last project anyway. So I hope that everyone can get done on June 7, okay? And again, it, it will be in your interest probably to demonstrate on June 7 anyway rather than working on it for one more week, because then I have to deduce all these points, right? So. Okay, doc. So that answers that one. Where do I want to go tonight? I want to go to Voronoi land, right? Voronoi diagrams are Voronoi complexes. And I also would like to hit on the dual the diagrams, which are called the Lorne complexes, or the Lorne diagrams, or the Lorne tessellations or triangulations. 
So uh, there is first the issue of well, how, what do these things look like in the case of point sets to be tessellated, diagrammed, or triangulated, and what are the data structures? Right? What are the data structures that we have to consider that we have to build and operate on in order to right, well, in order to handle Warner diagrams and the Warner triangulation? These data structures are very nasty, but they are very general. Okay, so. There are half edge data structures, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and all of that. And you need very complicated data structures to effectively operate on these general uh, tessellations. Um, it's a good exercise for everyone to do it. Again, I said in my own graduate career, the one assignment I didn't get done to my full satisfaction was a diagram on volumetric uh, Warner diagrams. Okay? It crashed on me, and um, I feel very bad about it. So, um, the other issue is how do we construct these things? Okay, first is the data structure. Assuming that you have a data structure kind of like designed, beautifully designed in the background with the proper operators for it, you still have to make a decision, a design decision. How do I construct a Warner diagram? Again, typically in, in, in computer science, um, you have two approaches to do things, right? Towers of Hanoi, you know, whatever problem you take, you can say I do things iteratively, one by one, first, second, third, fourth, or the other paradigm that we like in computer science so much because it's so beautiful but hard to debug is recursive approaches, right? If I have a complicated problem, but I can relate to a very simple, basic at atomic or, or anchor problem, then I can always take the complicated problem and subdivide it into simpler pieces, right? And say, a complicated problem given, subdivide it into two simpler problems until you come to this anchor case, the simple case, the most atomic case, solve that one, and then you recurse, go back up to merging all the partial results. So again, again I will talk about that. And the other issue is the degenerate cases in the Warner diagram and the Delaunay triangulations uh, or Delaunay complexes, because these complexes are not always triangulations, but more general, polygonal decompositions of space. How do we uh, represent these? How do we handle them? What are they good for? Uh, next, I will talk about uh, how we use these tessellations for interpolation, for data approximation, right? I mean, why do I talk about these things? Well, I talk about these things in the context of computing smooth interpolations, right? So we just have samples at random locations, at random sites. Uh, we first tessellate the space based on the location of these sites. And then, of course, we would like to construct a smooth um, uh, interpolation that interpolates the values we are given we are, no, uh, we are, uh, we are given at the site locations. OK, once we have that, well, well we, have, we need to know the Sipson interpolation. OK, Sipson is a very beautiful scheme that computes uh, a rather simple and straightforward uh, approximation over these tessellations, over uh, any tessellation actually, and specifically over Warner tessellations. Uh, once we have that, I should talk about uh, how, you, how you can, in a, in a very smooth and continuous way, do a transformation from Warner diagram here as one extreme to its dual diagram, namely the Delaunay tessellation, and there's a smooth geometric transformation or morph that morphs one into the other and the other into the one. Hmm? How to do that? It's really beautiful. And you can do that in all dimensions. So again, you should, of course, uh, implement your Warner diagram for arbitrary dimension. Right? I was kidding. Okay. If, you get it, if, if you get it working for 2D, it's great. If you succeed in making it work in 3D, it's really a, a major achievement. <laughs> Again, there's a, there's a site out there um, for Warner diagrams. It's warnoy.com or warnoy.org. I forget. But it's one of the major computational geometry sites. And either it's www.warnoy.com or it's warnoy.org. I'm not sure. But uh, there's a lot of uh, stuff there, a lot of links, uh, papers, references to papers, data structures, software, blah, blah, blah. Um, OK, so now let's talk about Warner diagrams, also called Thiessen diagrams, or Dirichlet tessellations, all the same stuff, developed around the same time in different contexts. But the name that's surviving is now this name, Warnoy. Uh, Warnoy diagrams. tessellations. And I'm only talking about those that relate to point sets as you, as you give an input. I also talked about the fact that these things can be generalized to more complicated 
uh, input, right? More complicated input than just point input. So two points, three points, many points. So again, the basic definition is uh, a tile or the region associated with a given site is a locus in space where every point in that locus is closer to the point defining that tile than to any other sites. So this half space is the tile uh, belonging to point one or site one, point one, and this tile is tile two belonging to tile two. Every point on this side is closer to x1. Every, one, every point in this half space is closest to x2 and not x1. So these things are called perpendicular bisectors because, well, this connector there, which is no longer drawn, huh, is a connector that hmm, connects in a perpendicular way. Three points, three points, I give you three happy points, and again, now this first case where we have an additional point introduced by this diagram, by the edges coming together, namely this guy and this guy, the circle guy, is typically called the Voronoi vertex. These guys are called sites. The original ones are called sites. And these guys that are induced or introduced by the intersecting edges of the diagram are typically called Voronoi edges, uh, Voronoi, uh, Voronoi vertices, Voronoi vertices. Okay, four points. Four points. Um, okay. Something like that. But I also want to draw uh, the gen degenerate case here, so you know that ugly things can happen in the case when the sites are really beautifully arranged. Right. So in the case that your sites happen to be co-circular, lying on a circle, okay, this situation, which is hmm, the, 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 the situation when you were to read in the locations of a mesh, which is a Cartesian mesh, right, a beautiful mesh, but for this particular Bono diagram, it represents a degenerate case. Why? Because typically you only have three uh, edges of the Bono complex coming together, as long as these sides are in so-called general position, okay, but as soon as you have uh, a subset of points, uh, more than three, uh, having the same, uh, lying on the same circle, you have the degenerate situation where you have more than three edges coming together in this Warner vertex. And in this case, it has valence four. And of course, you can have, in general, an arbitrary number of points lying on the same circle, right? So you have to really handle this for arbitrary co-circular arrangements. Um, this is that, this. Now, um, the many points case really is here. Let me call this the four point case. Uh, and I put the degenerate case here so you are aware of it. Right, again, the, the rationale here is these guys all lie on one circle. That's, that's the reason why that happens. And so here you have four points. And now we have many points. The many point case I can only illustrate beautifully for a nice arrangement of sites, otherwise it gets too complicated. And it looks like this. Dun, 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 so at this point, we can ask the question, what is necessary to represent this structure with the computer? Right? What is the data structure requirement? What are the elements that we are concerned with? Of course, one keeps in mind the particular operations one has to do on these diagrams. So There is a data structure, right? And there is not a unique data structure. There is many. There are many ways uh, how to represent this with a good data structure. Data structure needs. I just call them needs. 
how you uh, actually uh, realize them in terms of a particular classes and objects is another thing. So what are the elements? We have the sites. Those are vertices, right? Point us to particular locations, coordinates, x, y. Then you have these other, other locations, other points, the circles, these Warner vertices, which are also points, vertices, i.e. pointers to certain locations, x, y. What else do you have? Then you have this, this tile, right? This closed, it's always a closed, forget the boundary, it's always a closed polygon, a convex polygon of Warner vertices. So you need to have this notion of tile being a convex polygon of a finite number of finite length uh, segments. You have to worry about an order, clockwise, counterclockwise, etc., etc. What else do you need? Well, of course, you're interested in the neighborhood, right? This side is the neighbor of that guy. So somehow you probably want to, want to keep track of uh, the neighborhood. Or for each edge, store the two tiles, the up to two tiles sharing that edge, right? Things like that. So these are the, opera these are the things that, you, uh, that your data structure has to represent. So you have, uh, you need to represent sites. You need to represent the Warner vertices, wall vertices. You need to store the closed convex um, tiles, closed convex convex polygons, poly polygons defining tiles, polygons defining tiles, tiles, and so these would be the la the line segments, and then you probably want to store. Uh, the neighborhood information uh, between tiles. Uh, neighborhood. Neighborhood info. Maybe you want to store more, but typically these are the essential things that you want to store explicitly. And you have to worry about typically an order or orientation for all these guys. Right? So the tiles, of course, the tile boundary has to be a polygon of an arbitrary number of edges, mm, but an arbitrary number. So it has to be a linked list, I guess, right? A linked list of edges. And each edge is, is something that makes use of, well, two Warren vertices, right? Which are, is an entry into a table or a linked list of all the Warren vertices. Um, you have to worry about, I didn't talk about this, you have to make this finite, right? Somehow? Because the uh, tiles on the boundary, Jennifer, are, uh, of course, uh, infinite, right? They go off to infinity. We don't want that. So somehow, if all the algorithms assume that, well, you have convex tiles only and always have closed tiles, of course, you displace anyway, just hmm, a finite region. Close it somehow. Either put a bounding triangle around it or a bounding hexagon or a bounding box, whatever, right? Just cut the, di cut, cut the uh, diagram somewhere and make it finite. And then you will have indeed, if you do it properly, only convex tiles, closed convex tiles, of finite area everywhere. All right, that's that. Now you have to worry about a good structure to represent it. And then the structure also has to be good in terms of, of operating on this diagram, right? And so, I mean, the structure is always best if it's best for a particular application, right? If our application of this diagram will be to construct the Simpson interpolant over it. So when I talk about the Simpson interpolant, we have to think about, well, what is the essential operation or set of operations for that Simpson interpolant to uh, uh, effective, efficiently access the data that I need from the diagram. The other issue is, of course, the construction of the diagram itself, right? The construction of the diagram itself is a complicated and uh, time-consuming ta time task. You want then a data structure that makes it easy huh, to build the final uh, diagram for a million points. Again, the book to read about this, that is really discussed in great detail, is this book by, on computational geometry by Preparada. Preparada and Seamus. Must be now in its fifth or sixth edition. It's a very good book, okay, if you like this type of uh, thinking about geometry and discrete structures and tessellation. It's a very good book. The other, the other great books that you should read are books on geometry by Hochstetter, okay? 
classical books. This is a definite must for everyone in computer graphics who need to read this book. Um, Construction. So last time I already was hit, hit, uh, uh, hitting about on that. How do we construct the Warner diagram when we do it one by one? The one by one construction assumes that the Warner diagram is already there for n points, right? And now I'm inserting point n plus one somewhere. Right? That's at the beginning. That's easy, but when you are finding the process, then it's complicated, right? To probably insert an additional point to that one. So, this is now about construction. Construction of VDs, Warner diagrams. Okay, VD for Warner diagram or Warner complex. So, first is iterative. This is very important because this will be related to the uh, Simpson interpolant, related to Simpson. which is the basis of your third fun assignment. So, hmm? so we have an intermediate state. We have a diagram constructed for endpoints. And now we insert point number n plus 1. I have to draw this somewhat properly. Okay, so now insert uh, insert this guy, and I put this guy here. But again, this insertion location, of course, can be anywhere. And so, how does this work? Can someone remind the class how I did that last time? Yes, Jennifer? So last time you said that you find out which tile you're inserting it in, and Where then... Where am I? I'm living here, okay. Right, and then you get the perpendicular bisector between your new point and the tile's um, site point, and then you go until you intersect with another boundary, and then you have to modify... Um, the boundary. Once you once you hit one of the boundaries, then you modify it to get a new boundary, and then you remove the additional piece that's no longer needed. That's it. Yeah. So the cleaning up part, removing the stuff that's no longer needed, can happen while I'm completing these intersections, or I can do that as a post-processing step when I clean up locally. Okay. So again, first thing is um, I find out that star is inside inside tile i. Okay, tile i. If this guy here is uh, side i, and this is uh, tile i. So construct perpendicular bisector for this guy. Perpendicular bisector will be this line. What is the elementary operation in terms of geometry processing that I have to do next? I have to compute the intersection points, right? Between a line and a line, right? Or an infinite line and line segments, right? That's, you have to look it up. Computing the intersections between this infinite line, uh, the, the bisector is really infinite, and the finite length edge segments of that polygon. Hmm? Okay, so you find these points, and then you have to decide on a, on a direction or orientation of that line, and say I pick this direction. Okay, 
it means I will march around. I can always march around and construct the circle, a co another convex polygon. Right? And so now I'm entering Ti, I go into Tj, Tk, Tl, back to Ti. Okay, I have to construct the circle. I will always go around. Right? So now I'm entering this uh, next tile. Um, construct, construct all uh, new perpendicular bisectors, perpendicular <coughs> bisectors, sectors with tiles, with, uh, I just say the local tiles that are affected by this insertion. Meaning I have to find, now it's this neighborhood, I need the neighborhood information, right? I'm leaving this tile and its neighbor along this edge is this tile. I need to get, get, go here. I construct perpendicular bisector and I will end up there. Okay, now again, I'm entering the neighbor of this guy, the neighbor on this side is, well, so this guy, I have, sto I, have, I have that stored. And I go up and again, I have an orientation for these guys. Go here, intersect. And when I'm intersecting there, I know I'm done because I know I have to close it, right? I have to go back to the original other point. That's it. And now comes the cleanup part that Jennifer mentioned. This stuff here in the interior of the tile now has to go, and you have to update your Warner diagram. Okay, so what has happened? You have inserted a new site. You've inserted four new Warner vertices. You are getting rid of two no longer needed Warner vertices, and you cut away a segment of a tile of tiles and pieces of segments of tiles. Okay, so insert insert new Warner vertices, wall vertices, vertices, and uh, and uh, Warner edges, Warner edges into diagram into a VD, Warner diagram, and related to that, or a separate step, if you do it as a post-processing step, is to clean up, right? Eliminate um, Warner vertices and edges, or edge segments, that are no longer valid. Uh, eliminate, eliminate, uh, no longer valid, no longer valid, um, Warner vertices, wall vertices, and uh, tile, tile edges, or pieces of tile edges. Bam, bam, bam. There's always a local operation, right? So it's therefore also parallelizable, in a sense, right? If you insert in, in regions far away, by multiple layers of tiles, then you can insert. Because, of course, this update operation has an effect only local. Right? It's a local effect. So you could also do insertion here, which would have a local effect only there. Yeah? But it gets more difficult if you were to insert, if you tried to insert 15 points in one step in the same time. Okay. Then it's difficult. It's an interesting uh, aspect in its own right. So the other part is then, of course, the other way to construct is recursive. Um, so again, the, main pa the basic paradigm there is, I have too many points, more than two, therefore I have to take uh, one chunk of my points, call it the left chunk, put them in one bag, and take the right chunk, call it well, the right chunk, and then tessellate the left chunk, tessellate the right chunk, and then worry about how to merge the individual pieces. Um, so on the high level, this operates like this, right? If uh, two sides given, two sides given, then then you can construct the VD, right? That's all you can do. You can construct the Warner diagram only for two sides. Then construct the VD. Construct the Warner diagram. So this is your base case. Otherwise, you recurse. What's the else case? Otherwise, else, 
you first have to split, right? Uh, split uh, the set of sides into uh, nearly same, nearly equal size chunks, left and right. Split, split a uh, uh, set of sides, set of sides into um, nearly equal size, nearly equal size, equal size subsets. And then you uh, construct the Warner diagram for the two subsets indi individually. Construct, uh, construct the Warner diagram, VD, for the two subsets into two, right, into two. Uh, into two subsets. And then the last step is uh, uh, going up in the stack, namely merging the partial results. Uh, merge the uh, partial results. Partial results. So, and that, that procedure would be just calling, I mean, construct Warner diagram, right? Um, if you succeed programming it this way, it's a major success. Why? This step is very difficult. This step is super difficult, the merge step. Um, so this is the nightmare, okay? Well, I show, I show you, okay? This is really... This is bad. <laughs> Good. Um, when you're splitting it into the two subsets, is there any particular way that you split Very, very good point. I didn't say that. That's the next level of thinking, right? And you think about that already. Yes, it would be good to split along a well-chosen half plane or line, okay? And so you want to split it into n and n plus um, n and a half and n and a half points or n and a half plus one and n and n. Uh, Roughly the same size, plus minus one. Okay? So that's the number, but then you have the split plane. You would, would like to have a plane so that all, I mean, all the points, half of the points lie to the left and the other half, or half plus one, lie to the right. Okay? So which plane you choose doesn't matter, as long as you have such a plane. That makes the merging easier. Um, because you do not just want to take randomly right, a subset of points from everywhere, and then the other subset also randomly from everywhere. No, you want to have them spatially, spatially in the same region, right? All right, illustration. And so I alluded to this fact that you just were, uh, were talking about, Jennifer. Um, uh, split, split the four-point case, four-point case, four-point case uh, by using a I mean, half plane, right, a line, cut line, uh, a good cut line, good uh, split line. And so again, the example will make, make it clear how I do that. Um, say I have... Uh, a bunch of sides, and I'll call them left chunk, which will be uh, those little solid squares. And uh, the other one will be uh, bullets. Okay. Initially, it was just all bullets, but there were four bullets, too many, therefore split it. And how did I split it? I used a split plane like that. Hmm? And this split, this split plane is a good one because uh, half of the points lie to the left of that plane and half of the points lie to the right of the plane. That's good, okay? And this would be a good split plane too, okay? Because half of them are above, half of them are below. So you use any, uh, any, any uh, split plane, hyperplane, that has roughly half of the points to its left and the other half to its right, okay? And then you operate on this subset and you operate on that subset. And so the first partial result is this. 
Borne diagram you get, and your other processor, processors maybe even, happily operate away on this guy and give you that. And now comes merging. How do you match that? How do you do that? Algorithmically, think about that for a minute. That, that's the difficult part. How do you do that? Start with any sites that are in the same tile. Like, kind of look at the uh, the union of the two and see. Uh, but then, I don't know, maybe you don't know that info from the start. I mean, visually, it's easy to say, okay, those two in the middle end up in the, are in the same tile from that. Are, these are the partial results, right? This This is the result from... Uh, this is step one, recursion, step two, and here's the difficult part, step three. Okay, so this is the output after two, output after two. Well, it's not the output, it's intermediate, intermediate uh, state. And now, uh, this is the subconstruction, right, for step three, subconstruction that has to happen for step three. For step three. So I'm gonna blow it up a little bit more. So you have square say and the square and the circle and the circle. Okay, and you have the partial results. You construct the so-called cut line. You start with a tile that is open. Huh? This one, I choose this one. Okay. Now you construct for this particular site, the bisector on its other side with a point, with a side that belongs to the other point set, will be one. So this guy is now viewed in context with that guy. Okay? So there will now be a bisector for this square and that circle. Okay? Then that means you also enter, you leave this tile, you enter this tile. That means Again, you will have the case to consider one point square from left point set and one point bullet from right point set, and you construct the bisector for that pair. Then, well, you will hit the next hmm, piece of partial result B, and then you again will have to construct a new bisector between a square point, left point set, and the bullet point, right point set. Okay? And it is this construction of the scat line, split line, which is extremely complicated. Okay, again. Um, so. <coughs> All right, so bisector here, outside from this infinite, infinite one coming, coming. So I make it dashed line so you see it. Okay. Coming from here, this is a bisector in this tile between this guy and that guy intersecting there, new Warner point. Then entering new tile, therefore bisector between this and this guy, uh, dashed line. Okay, intersecting another bisecting uh, segment here. And leaving this tile, entering new tile, now bisector between this and this, always two points belonging to the two different uh, subsets. And then this bisector will be this. That is the split line. OK. 
okay. And afterwards, again, you have to clean up. What do you have to clean up? This is an orientation, and the orientation of the strip line will tell you which pieces you have to eliminate or you have to clean up. You have to take this, this one out, and you have to take uh, this one out, right? Um, this is already hard to understand for just four points, right? Now you have to do it for that and debug your program and analyze your stacks, right? <laughs> but which one is faster, the iterative methods method or the uh, recursive method? Well, it seems like the recursive method might be easier to parallelize, at least for the splitting part. So yeah. maybe that has an advantage in that sense. Yeah. Yeah, the way I've talked about here is split it into two subsets, right? If you think about many, many more cores and many, many more threads, of course, then you can split it into 256, right, subsets. And that would be great. Uh, I do not know whether there's too much work out there where people actually take advantage of the uh, multi-core architectures to do that. Of course, the merge step then becomes even more complicated, right? You can imagine. This is, o this is order n log n. For n sites, it takes uh, n log n time to compute that thing recursively. Iteratively, is it order n? Think about that, okay? I just say recur recursion is always n log n, right? <laughs> so uh, recursion is n log n. Think about the time complexity for um, iterative method. So that is from data, those are the diagrams, those are the data structures we need, this is insertion, what has to happen, um, so what do we need there? So the elementary operation there in terms of geometry processing is we always need to ins uh, intersect a finite line segment with a param parametric infinite line, right? That's this thing, you have to have that going and very well for all kinds of degenerate cases also, right? When things are parallel, divide by zero, blah, 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 not a number, you have to handle that. So the uh, essential step or the essential computation for, the, for this essential uh, step is a robust line intersector, right? A robust robust line, line is infinite here, slash edge, and edge is finite. Line edge intersector. But you know how to do that. All right. Now we have the Warner diagrams and their construction. Um, should I talk about the Simpson diagram next? Uh, the, the Simpson interpolation next? Because it relates to project number three. And toward the end of the class, I should be talking about project number three, right? Because you begin with that after your demonstrations tonight. Um, if I talk about the Simpson interpolation now, that will take about 10 minutes, then I can talk about 15 minutes, we can talk together about project number three yeah, and, and, and discuss it jointly and, and so forth. Okay, so, and this is now the Simpson, Simpson uh, interpolation scheme. So in a sense, you can also call this uh, a local natural neighbor base interpolation scheme. Local, okay, we talked about local schemes before in the context of Shepard and Hardy, what you will demonstrate tonight. It is good to sometimes restrict, restrict your operations to a finite local stencil of influencing data, right? Because stuff far away shouldn't have an influence what's going on in my immediate neighborhood. 
And then you always just have this nightmare problem of setting k, the number of elements to be considered in this neighborhood, right? Usually people just set one global k, right? k nearest neighbors. There's a bunch of papers out there on k and n hmm? schemes for doing this, for doing that. And so the Warner diagram, in a sense, uh, is a natural structure uniquely defined by the sites and also defines locally what the neighbors are, the local neighbors for every site. This site has, well, one, two, three, four, five, six neighbors. That's it, right? Six neighbors. And this stencil of points is probably the stuff that, well, is the stuff I should consider when I approximate inside that tile. Now, any, a tile can have an arbitrary number of edges. So this is number k, right? k neighbors. So k would be they are a varying number here, right? If I have six edges in my tile, I have six neighbors, so I would use, well, seven points for local computations. A point in the center of the tile plus its six neighbors. Sometimes I have tiles that have 18 edges, right? So 18 neighbors have a point and point inside. But nevertheless, uh, this neighborhood here is the natural neighborhood. So it, the, this Warner diagram automatically takes care of uniqueness, point density, point distribution, uh, an arbitrary, adaptively chosen, but uniquely specified by VD, K for nearest neighbor computations, and indeed those are neighbors, right? So th th that is very cool, and Simpson uh, takes advantage of that. The Simpson interpolation scheme uses the VD as the uh, structure, structure to uniquely define local neighborhoods, to uniquely define uh, local neighborhoods, local neighborhoods it's phenomenal. and many, many more other great advantages. So how does it work? And I just give you the example. And then you will see right away how it works. How does it work? And so the details uh, of this construction I talk about are in these various papers by Gerald Farron. So I think one of the papers I gave you, see papers, not just one, many, papers by Gerald Farron. Okay, and I use my uh, prototypical nice case over there to explain it. Okay, what do I need to do? Well, I want to make a picture, right, over this region. To make a picture, I need an approximation. To make an approximation, I need some kind of well, approximating function. If I were to render this a smooth, shaded picture, then I need for all the pixels in this, in, over this particular region, I need some means for approximating function values at any location right, that covers this particular region in space. Specifically, I will need to have a function value here. Okay? So the question is, how do I get a function value at this location? Okay. Um, principle. Principle. Uh, I say this in colloquial English. To estimate, no, to compute the Simpson value at location asterisk, you perform a pseudo insertion of that asterisk into the diagram. Okay. To obtain to obtain 
uh, Simpson value, Simpson value at an arbitrary location asterisk at arbitrary arbitrary location location asterisk we insert we uh, pseudo insert pseudo insert uh, that point the evaluation site into DVD. Okay, that is step one. Pseudo insertion is well insertion, but not really performed in, in the sense of updating the diagram. Okay, this is the diagram. This is the Warner diagram we have, and you just need to construct a smooth function living above the sticks coming out above the sides, right? So now we do exactly what I did here, okay? And I, I will uh, overlay this particular quadrilateral onto the tessellation that I have here. So the additional overlaid tessellation I get looks like this, right? And I do not really perform this insertion. But I will consider these areas. Say I can locally enumerate these guys and call this point 1, this is point 2, this is point 3, this is point 4. Right? The tile neighborhood that gets affected, uh, that were affected, if I were to insert this point into the tile. And then I see, I see certain chunks of the old tiles being eaten away or cut away by this insertion. Okay? All right. So now we have a certain area. I call this area of this particular well quadrilateral. I call this an area one. Here is a little area of a triangle region, right? I call this well. It belongs to this tile. I call it area two. Here is a little quadrilateral region again. It is a part of tile three. So I call this quadrilateral region uh, area area three. And here is another triangle piece uh, eaten away from tile four, and I call that a four. What do I have? Well, I said we do this for interpolation, right? So at all these sides, I have the x values and a function value, a measurement, a temperature, a salinity, a contamination value, whatever it is. So at all the sides, I also have a function value, right? I have function value 1, I have function value 2, I have function value 3, I have function value 4. And what I want is, well, I want a function value at this location for rendering, for rotating, right? For making a picture, hmm? a smooth surface above this board. So the issue is, well, this is an arbitrary point P, and it will have a value F. What is F at P? Um, um, the value F at P should be an average of the values of the natural neighbors. Right? The natural neighbors of this insertion side, or evaluation side, are considered as these neighbors. These neighbors, point 0.1, point 0.2, point 0.3, point 0.4, are the ones that will have influence on the value at P, that local stencil. Okay? So um, function values, FCT values, use FI in neighborhood. And the neighborhood is the neighborhood affected by this pseudo insertion. Function values of our neighborhood uh, will be combined, right? Will be combined, combined to obtain an estimate or to obtain uh, a function value, function value at the, the site asterisk, the location asterisk, where I want to have a function value.
and now follow your intuition. The answer is already on the board, right? The closer the evaluation site is to the actual location of an original site, well, the more influence that particular original site should have, right? And this is reflected by the, by the this weight is reflected by those areas, right? The areas play the role of weights. The larger the area, the closer is that evaluation location to the center of that respective tile that contains the largest area. And the other smaller areas are, are cut away from those tiles where the centers are further away and therefore those values there should have less influence. Right? So it's beautiful. It considers just the local neighborhood and it's area based and there's hmm, all of that. So, and this is Sipson. Sipson. Um, in colloquial English, use the uh, um, uh, areas areas AI of this, I mean, resulting from this pseudo-insertion, it's not really an insertion, right? you know what I mean, areas resulting from this pseudo-insertion as weights Ways to uh, combine or average or blend to combine, well, to combine the FIs, right? Combine FIs. So then the function value, the function value at P is um, something divided by something. Uh, always divide by the sum of the weights, right? The sum of the weights. I make the formula specific. It's from 1 to 4, right? It's just four tiles involved here, but you know that this is an arbitrary k. So it is from R1 to 4 areas, the sum of the weights. And then above here, it has to be those areas serving as weights for the function values. I from 1 to 4, the areas AI times the FIs. Again, this is a specific case. This formula has to be a general k, right? No? Depending on the number of cutaway regions that I get when doing this step. So that's the way it works. Uh, or in the general case, I can also write this. Well, there's a sum, right? It's just one sum. I from 1 to a local k k being the number of cutaway regions. Um, and so it is the areas, area i, divided by the sum of all those little mini areas, that is sum j from 1 to k, uh, j from 1 to k of the aj's, times the function value of k. I've written it in a slightly different way, but put by, by putting this one uh, into this sum to show that this is a convex combination, actually, which is also nice. Okay. So these are now the weights, right? You can think of these now as the weights. Weights high. <coughs> so this is in nothing but i from k of weights times function values. And so the beautiful thing is that these weights are again, I mean, they are positive, obviously. And well, the sum total of all these weights is 1, which makes this thing a convex combination, which is beautiful. Huh? So this is a convex combination. Just look it up what it is. Convex combination meaning that the resulting graph surface there that you construct cannot wildly oscillate, but it will be bounded, right? And well behaved. So this is nice. And now I would love to talk about the um, last assignment. Just want to make sure that there's nothing I should talk about before talking about the uh, assignment 
Da-da-dum, da-dum, da-dum. Should I do this? Should I do this and talk about the Delaunay complex? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I should. I should. Because some of you guys might actually use that to store the Warner diagram. Since I want to really talk about the third assignment, I make this quick. So the dual, the dual structure, the dual of the and now I use this word complex of the Voronoi complex. Complex, complex is the Delaunay complex, not triangulation. The Delaunay, Delaunay or Delaunay complex. One implies the other as its dual, so you only need to store one. If you store the Delaunay. You have the Voronoi coming out as a byproduct. If you saw the Voronoi, you have the Delaunay coming out as a byproduct. So therefore, then it becomes a question, for your purposes, which structure is better to handle, to store, to operate on, hmm, and to understand and to debug. Hmm? It doesn't really matter, because these things are really dual. All the algorithms that require one of these two can really be realized by using one of the two. Okay, illustration, how this works. And I first do uh, my nice example, and then a generate example, where you will see that triangulation is not always triangulation, but sometimes it's more general, and therefore it's a complex. Uh, okay, so those are the sides. Our happy. Uh, Warner diagram looks like this. That's VD. And uh, so we have the Warner, di uh, the Warner complex, the VC, being dual to the DC. Okay? You only really need one or the other for all the computations, for all the processing. But in terms of proving certain characteristics, it's better to think of one or the other. All right, so what is dual to this? Here are those Warner vertices. Okay, I still indicate them. I have these little happy circles. And so what, what, is, what, what is obvious in this particular case? Of the, about the circles. The circle all satisfy the same condition in this particular diagram. All circles are the locations where how many edges come together? Three, triangulation, Delaunay. So, okay, there's a triangle that has These circles at its center, you can think of it that way. Not really, but in topological sense. Okay, so how, where are the triangles in this case? The dual of this diagram is constructed by connecting now neighbors. Again, there's a natural neighbor definition here, right? Two points are neighbors in this diagram when there is uh, a bisector separating them. These guys are neighbors because there exists this line segment. These guys are neighbors because they are separated by this line segment. These guys are neighbors. Huh? So 
there's a stencil of three lying all around the Sorner vertex that will define a triangle. And now I've given it all away. Now you see the triangles all over, right? You see them? These three guys form a triangle because these two are neighbors, these two are neighbors, and this and this are neighbors, so therefore they form a triangle. And I will not draw all of them, but just some of them. You can fill in the rest, okay, at home. And this and this point, they are neighbors because here's this bisector lying there. This and this are neighbors, and these two guys are neighbors. So there's a triangle. Yeah? It's a little bit skinnier triangle, but nevertheless, it is a happy triangle and it lives here. Okay, this thing is symmetric, so I only have to maybe fill in a few more on the left side. The right hand side is the same. Okay, this goes on. So these guys are the Voronoi edges. And the dashed ones are the uh, Delaunay edges. Del, not for the Delmar, but for Delaunay. It's easy, right, to look at the Warner diagram and see the triangulation now. You will see it now forever, right? Whenever you look at the Warner diagram now, you will see the triangulation right away. The other way around is not so obvious to see the Warner diagram, okay? If I just were to draw the triangulation for your visual apparatus to see the Warner tiles, it's more complicated because those tiles are more complicated, right? Hmm? But our eye immediately sees the triangles all over, which is interesting. So, um, and again, you only just saw one or the other, and then there's a transformation algorithm that transforms from one to the other. You have to think about which data structure is easier to handle, easier to update, and what are the operations that you need for your particular algorithm, right, to benefit from the advantages of the triangulation versus rather well, more general Warner diagram. But I said this is a complex, and so I want to talk about the complex word, uh, why that is, why, why we cannot say it's always a little triangulation, but it's something more general. And the issue is, again, the issue of uh, 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 co-circular cases, but uh, co-circular uh, point or side arrangements, point uh, arrangements, which always give you, give you, uh, give you uh, headaches in, in programming because you have to handle zero or epsilon. So, Okay, these four obviously lie in a circle, and here's a triangle. Okay, so the Warner diagram, the Warner diagram for this uh, point set looks like this, right? So the Warner diagram already is a degenerate one because it has this one Warner vertex here of valence four. Here is valence three. So now what is the dual of that thing? So the dual of that diagram is defined by the neighborhood relationships as induced by the edges of the Warner complex, right? So you establish, that's the way you have to think about it, you establish edges between sides whenever there's a Warner edge between them, okay? So you just do that. For every pair of sides separated by an edge in the Warner diagram, introduce a dashed line. So when you do that, you get these dashed lines. And the result will be something. And you have to analyze that something. And you see that this is not a triangle, right? That you get here. It's a quadrilateral happy rectangle, a quadrilateral. You get one triangle. But this example is just to serve one purpose, namely to point out that, well, if the Warner diagram is of a degenerate nature, the resulting the Lonnet complex is degenerate nature. So, um, So, so this is one, two, three, and four. This is side five, 
and 1, 2, 3, and 4 are co-circular, therefore you get a quadrilateral as an element of the Delaunay complex, right? 1, 2, 3, 4 are co-circular points, co-circular, and therefore obtain, obtain a quadrilateral of 4, right? This is also important, a 4. That's why you get the four-sided thing, the quadrilateral. Obtain a quadrilateral. Quadrilateral as a polygon. Polygon in the uh, Dell complex. Okay, that's enough about that. And now we talk about uh, project number three. And whenever there are questions, then you send me to the board and I have to explain them, right? The answers to those questions. All right. Du -du 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 -du. Project number three. Let's take a look. Do you all have it with you? Okay, because the Warner diagrams are fresh, on our mind, fresh on the board, it's easy to immerse ourselves into this text. Multi-resolution Warner diagrams are used to visualize data, blah, blah, blah. So what's the high-level purpose of this assignment? The high-level purpose is I have a million sites in this room, sensor locations where I measure the temperature, and using all the one million locations to construct an approximation might be overkill. Maybe not to be seen. So initially, I will just uh, grab 100 sites randomly, and I construct a Simpson interpolation based on 100 sites. It's already complicated and already costly because the Simpson stuff is not cheap. But I get a beautiful, nice, hopefully well approximating function based on just 100 sites. Okay. Now I somehow have to evaluate how good how good the quality is of this initial approximation. I need to measure the error. Right? Does this initial approximation capture all the values or the measurements that I had to begin with? If so, done. If not, I have to use more sites, right? more measurements, more temperature readings. So if 100 sites are not sufficient, then I go to 200 sites, then I go to 400 sites, then I go to 800 sites, and so forth. Right? In some kind of incremental way, I add numbers uh, somewhere. Where do I? add additional data? Well, I add data there where I have large error. That also makes this hierarchy adaptive in terms of the complexity of the phenomenon that I measure. The airflow is much more complicated there, right? The duct. It's not so complicated probably there in the corner. It, the air is standing still. Temperature doesn't vary a lot, right? So in order to capture the more, much more vari variable uh, temperature over there, I probably need more readings there. Huh? So that's the, that's the purpose of adaptive multi-resolution methods. Multi-resolution methods are used to analyze and visualize data at multiple levels of resolution or, or, or detail. Warner diagrams can be used as a natural grid for scattered data. Natural in the sense I talked about. Uh, for this project, we are going to construct a hierarchy of Warner diagrams for scalar-valued functions in the plane. So you just have the plane x, y locations and you have uh, function values sticking out of those locations. Okay. Could be height values, right? Terrain. Terrain height, terrain elevation, height field data is a function of longitude, latitude, x, y. Uh, you will construct the hierarchy of Warner diagrams for such data by iteratively inserting points into appropriate regions. So you do it in a, in a clever way. You just do not grab points anywhere. You pick the points there where you need it, namely there where the, well, where the flow field and therefore the temperature field is complicated. Okay, given a set of Scattered data, you must first determine and represent the convex hull. Okay, that's, I mean, the first order of business. You want to make your area to operate on finite, right? You, you embed everything into a box. Makes it simple, makes it easy, bounding box, okay? All the scattered data will have a min x and max x and min y, max y, and so put a box around it. And the four corners become additional helper vertices, right? That you treat properly. Uh, you construct the convex hull. And I'm saying it will be fine if the data sets you are cho uh, you, you're choosing are, well, those that have the unit square as a convex hull to begin with. Fine. You should consider the, uni uh, the unique Simpson interpolant that interprets all the given values uh, 
as the test function. Okay, so um, this is this is the ultimate goal, right? Ultimately, you would you would uh, you would like to convert to something that is the real thing, and I'm saying the real thing towards which you would like to converge in your process is the Simpson interpolant that is based on all the sites, right? That is the real thing. That is as good as it gets because it's all you have. Right? You have a million readings. So the best possible way to represent that thing is probably with a Simpson interpolant using those one million readings. Boom. Alternatively, if that is too much or too complicated, I would also accept if you have an analytical function. Okay? You can also say the ultimate goal towards which I would like to converge right, and improve my iteration, my, my insertion, is to approximate the function f of x, y equals x squared plus y squared using an analytically defined test function. Either you, you compare an error against that analytical function, or you say, well, my ultimate truth is the Simpson interpolant based on all the sites that I have. That's the best, uh, that's the ground truth. All right, so that is that. Test function points determine those points in the original data set that suffice to define the original data set's convex hull. If you indeed start with um, a bounding box, uh, that is a square, well, you only need the four corner points to begin with, right? So your initial thing just consists of those four corner points. And uh, bup, 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 and the, the smallest points that you call level zero, right? So the smallest Warner diagram that you start with is level zero. And now you, you make it better and better and better by inserting more and more sites. Uh, the level zero point set implies a unique Warner diagram and a unique Simpson interpolant. And you need to compute an error estimate, how good this, uh, how good this um, approximation is. So maybe I should talk about uh, two errors that I think are good ones to consider for this assignment. Uh, errors for project three. Errors for project three, P3. So this is our, I just draw it for the univariate, one-dimensional case. We have some kind of ground truth, okay? So this is the evaluation of your Simpson interpolation, right? Simpson interpolant based on all a gazillion points, okay? So it looks like a smooth function. Okay, and now you have to, uh, no, this, this is the Simpson interpolant based on a small number, on a small number of readings. And now you have all these other guys which are only approximated by it. The Simpson interpolant will interpolate some of them, but not all of them, because you have not inserted all sites. You have only inserted, you have only picked a small number of sites that are indeed interpolated by this Simpson function, but not all of them. Some of these readings or data that you have will lie above or below the approximating function that you have. So this thing is the Simpson, right? the Simpson function of x that you have based on a small number of sites, and you always have to compute well, what is the error. How far are all these other guys still away from the approximation? So this would be an arbitrary location or site, xi. And here it's, 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 that is its value, right, fi. And it has a certain distance to, well, the Simpson interpolant evaluated at the same location. So you have to do that for all the sites. So the error. The error, root mean square RMS, would be root mean 1 over n, all sides, square, root mean square. It sums up over all sides, one, 1 to n, the squared distances, di squared. Okay, What is a di squared? This distance or difference is that di squared is indeed um, fi, the original reading there, minus the approximation, Simpson evaluated at that location squared. Okay? So you look at all the squares of these differences, you sum them up, you divide by the number of sides, mean, and then you take the square root. The other one, uh, the other error, RMS stands for root mean square, the other one is the maximum error, error max would be the maximum of all these differences between the original sticks right, and the approximating function. So the max error would be the maximal value of max 
of the set of all the absolute uh, difference values between the fi's and the approximation there, Sipson at xi, for all sides, i from 1 to n. Okay. So this is the general notion of the error. You need to define approximate error to define the deviation of an intermediate interpolant based on a subset of the original sites and the, data and the Simpson's interpolant of all original data, or alternatively, of an analytic analytically known function. You must decide yourself which error measure you use, and I just suggested that you use these two, uh, root mean square and maximum. We talked about possible measures in class indeed. Your program must iteratively refine intermediate Warner diagram by choosing a subset of the original data set and inserting the chosen additional points into the diagram, thus leading to a better approximation. Um, you can insert multiple points in one refinement step. You might even do that in parallel if you want to do parallel programming. You can insert points that are in the original data set, blah, 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 convergence to the test function. Which points should you insert in a refinement step? That's the italic question in the assignment. I suggest using tile-specific errors, but you can do whatever you want to do. Okay? So again, the issue is you would have a Simpson interpolation living above a particular tessellation of space, and in some tiles or over some tiles, you have big errors, larger errors than in other tiles. Okay? Obviously, the phenomenon or the function uh, will be more complicated in cer over certain tiles than other tiles. So those tiles that should become refined and smaller and smaller, right, represented by smaller tiles, should be those where you have large error values. So therefore, these errors that you compute there, they should be specific to a tile. Huh? You would like to know in which regions, i.e. over what tile, do you have a big error? A big root mean square or a big max error, right? And then, well, inside the tile, there will be a bunch of additional sites which are not yet part of the Warner diagram, and you insert some. 5, 10, 50. Okay, you can play with that number. And then ultimately, you will see you should see a refined tessellation coming out that has a lot of original sites clustered there where the phenomenon, the image, the picture, the function is complicated and only big, big tiles and few sites in areas where the function is constant. You, you see that? You can picture that, how that works? Right? You have an initial very coarse tessellation. You compute errors for the tiles. Right? You consider all the original values of the sites inside a tile relative to the SIPS interpolation, if those errors, which are specific for each tile, are larger in this tile than in that one, then you refine first the tile where you have large error. And you refine by picking more points in it and inserting it. And again, you can go directly from 100 sites to 200 to 400 to 800, right? And call that level 0, level 1, level 2. But again, there is some. There's lots of. De uh, there are. There are lots of. Uh, there's a large degree of freedom here, and you can play with that. Take advantage of that. I just say I suggest using tile-specific errors to identify the tile with largest error. This tile specifies a subset of original data from which to choose uh, for the next refinement step. A rigorous approach would identify those data in the original set whose insertion would maximally reduce the error. Right. That would be an optimal way to insert. Right. If you have um, a million points left from which you can choose. You should choose that one from the one million that would maximally reduce the error. Right? That would be the best way to insert. But to do it that way, it, you have to try them all and then see this is a winner. I right? can't do it that way. Choose. Are you maintaining all these error data points, or are you deallocating them? It seems like a, a little bit of a nightmare. Um, you keep all the data, but you only have you only have the raw data to play with. In a sense, you are just, in, uh, you are just forcing an, uh, an order onto the sites. That's all you do. If I have a 1,000 readings of temperature in this room, all I'm doing with this procedure is saying these initial 10 points are the best 10 points I can choose. Then I, then I add an additional 20, then I add an additional 40, and then at the end, I'm using all 100. I'm just you. In the end, I'm using just all the all the sites I'm given. Never, never more. So the question is, how to uh, how to come up with the ideal index? This is site one, site two, site three. That's the ultimate goal. Okay. Uh, if if I were to if uh, if I were to refine a Warner diagram by doing it in this order, site one, site two, site three, site one thousand, I get the best possible hierarchy. Right. 
But in terms of storage overhead or overhead at all for points, no. I start with a thousand points or end with a thousand points. All I'm doing is I kind of like create an order for them. Hmm? Not the best one, but some order. Um, and yes, for each level in this in this ordered set of sites, I have to keep track of the associated Warner diagram. That, that's the overhead. Um, uh, your program has rendered the Warner diagram of all the, appro of the approximation levels in the plane. You must render the interpolant as flat shaded triangular surfaces or by a very interpolant on uniform grid that is triangulated. So again, uh, that is just the part of, uh, uh, I said you have some kind of bounding box, right? And you pick the corners as pseudo points, right? And now you want to render, when you render this thing, right, based on this tessellation, then, well, of course, your, your grid for evaluation will be this Cartesian grid, huh? or uni for sure uniform grid, if you want to use triangles for rendering the surface that sits here above the, above the board, then, of course, you can split these into triangles. Huh? And usually what I would do is I gerociate the resulting function values in this plane, in the xy plane, but I also like to see the surface that comes out because the function values are the function values at these locations, right? They evaluate. Huh? So there's a surface sitting here. And in order to see the surface better, don't use Gros shading for the triangles, but use one color per triangle so you, re you really see the triangle facets. Huh? Okay. So don't go overboard with the rendering and the visualization and the illumination and the lighting. Um, the focus of this assignment really is uh, constructing in the best possible way and efficient way these levels of the tessellation. Hmm? The, the, that's where the cleverness comes in. How you pick the right points, how you insert the points of, uh, eff effectively uh, with minimal computation time and minimal storage overhead. That, that's where the challenge will lie. And again, I'm only asking you to do this for the two-dimensional case. All right. 740, we will have demonstrations, right?